The Lord be with you. Greetings and salutations. My name is Matt King Smith. Uh, welcome to Grace Presbyterian, celebrating Christ's universal love. We seek to do justice, embrace kindness, and walk humbly with God. Thank you for being part of today's worship. Please make your presence known with a Facebook message. In-house guests are encouraged to complete a guest card and leave it in the offering plate. Next Sunday, July 2nd, we eagerly anticipate worshiping with the Brown Memorial Presbyterian Church Congregation, Dr. Reverend Joe Scribner, the minister. Brown Memorial is located just inside the main entrance of Stillman College. Their service begins at 11 o'clock. This week's Friday Night Social is hosted by the Altman family. The following, the following Friday is at Fairytale Farm. There's going to be games, dinner, games, a campfire, and where there's campfire, you know there'll be s'mores. To assist with planning, please RSVP via email to office at gracetuscaloosa.org. When reading the Bible, you frequently find the phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But someone is missing, actually several someones. But today we learn God is also the God of Hagar, a female, a foreigner, and a slave. Let us worship El Roi, the God who sees me. Good morning. Call to worship. Done responsively, please. Glory be to you, God of all people, you who have made us siblings in one family. Thanks be to you, Christ of compassion, when we were lonely and cast out, you claimed us as your own. Praise to you, Spirit, for when we were in danger, you saved us. Come again and make us your own. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit, to transform us by your grace. Alleluia. God of love, may your grace give us faithfulness. Christ, may your love give us courage. Holy Spirit, may your presence give us trust. Loving God, in a world that is afraid of love, help us to be loving. Amen. for that hymn. It was, uh, it was beautiful. Um, it helped me kind of like center myself. Let us, um, let us hear the call to reconciliation. To open our hearts to God is to risk vulnerability, judgment, and condemnation. But throughout the scriptures, we learn that God is merciful and just, slow to anger, and eager to forgive. 
Let us then risk our confession. Most merciful God, we confess our sin. We have suppressed wonder and gratitude. We have withheld love. We have stood by our tears. Receive us, forgive us, and heal us, that we may truly be your children. And truly be siblings of all people, in the name and spirit of Christ. Amen. My friends, my brothers and sisters, let us hear, let us listen to the words of pardon. In God's faithfulness, we are made righteous. In Christ's love, we find peace and hope. In the Spirit's strength, we are made whole. Thanks be to God. And in the spirit of being forgiven, being assured that God has wiped away all of our sins, let us forgive one another and let us share a sign of peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Peace of God with you. You want to come in? Oh, you're wearing purple. Purple is my favorite color. Did you know that? Yeah, I got this baby. Oh, you got this baby? I got a baby, too. But it's a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, mine is made of baby bricks. What's oh. that? What this is the microphone. Yeah, yeah it's the paint. This. What, this? what is this? What is this? Oh, yeah, this is a microphone. See, look. See, you put it in the ear, and you see the sound. You hear the sound? See? Yeah. Wow. It's like magic. <laughs> How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? Are you sleepy? Are you okay? No, you're not sleepy? Oh, okay. Good. You had your, you had your caffeine this morning? Okay, good. Yeah, my daughter drinks caffeine around 2 o'clock in the morning. So, yes, uh, so she keeps us awake. But it's, uh, it's wonderful to see you all. Um, today I want to talk to you about a topic in particular. But before I go into it, let me ask you something. How many of you are scared of something? Do you experience fear? You know what fear is? Yeah, do you experience that? You're not scared? Okay, well that's good. I wanna be like you when I grow up, okay? So. I'm sorry? What did you say? I'm saying I'm not scared of fairies. Oh, you're not scared of fairies, me neither. Yes, you don't have to because you need to say you're not scared of fairies. You believe in fairies. Because otherwise, the fairies, the fairies die. Yeah, what? I know some are scared. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, for those of you who have experienced fear, what are the kind of things that you're scared of? Are you scared of something? Um, Monsters, I know. Um, yes. And ghosts. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And bats. Okay, that makes sense. How else? Are you scared of something? You want to share? No? You want to share what you're scared of? You want to share what you're scared of? Yes. yes? What are you scared of? You used to be scared of what? The dark, yes. The dark 
can be very scary. You know what I'm scared of? I am super scared of sharks and gators. I'm super scared. And snakes. And guess, who, guess where I'm living? I'm living in Alabama, where there's a lot of snakes <laughs> and there's a lot of gators. Can you believe that? I, well, not here, but you know. But gators and sharks and, um, and snakes, they're all, but they're, but they're all wonderful. Yeah, only the poison ones. But guess what I've learned? I've learned that snakes are a one, they're wonderful. Gators are wonderful. God, okay? But it doesn't mean that we feel, right, that we feel a sense of discomfort, that we feel a sense of I'm out of control, right? Because that's what fear is about. So today in the text, God, through Jesus, is calling some people to follow him. And you know when you have to follow someone, that can be scary, right? Because you don't know what their intentions are. You don't know if they're a good person or not, right? If I say to you, if a stranger comes to you and says, come on, follow me, what are you supposed to do? You're not supposed to follow them, right? Because that is scary. Yes, with your mom, yes. You have to call your mommy, yes. But what God is telling us today in the Bible is, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, she's very smart, you're very smart. Then she will have to follow you, right? Because she will not follow her grandmother, right? Yes, that's cute, it's hilarious. Okay, I love it. She has to follow me. She has to follow you, yes. Uh -huh, tell me. Sorry, who who is that? Who is who is the pastor? I am so sorry, and I. I
Okay, now for the prayer of illumination. Inspire us in our hearing of today's scriptures and move us into life-changing acts of grace, love, hope, and peace. Amen. First reading is from the Old Testament, Genesis 21, 8 through 21. The boy grew and stopped nursing. On the day he stopped nursing, Abraham prepared a huge banquet. Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing, the one Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, send this servant away with her son. This servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son Isaac. Well, this upset Abraham terribly because the boy was his son. God said to Abraham, don't be upset about the boy and your servant. Do everything Sarah tells you to do because your descendants will be traced through Isaac. But I will make of your servant's son a great nation too because he is also your descendant. Abraham got up early in the morning took some bread and a flask of water and gave it to Hagar. He put the boy in her shoulder sling and sent her away. She left and wandered through the desert near Beersheba. Finally, the water in the flask ran out and she put the boy down under one of the desert shrubs. She walked away from him about as far as a bow shot and sat down telling herself, I can't bear to see the boy die. She sat at a distance, cried out in grief, and wept. God heard the boy's cries, and God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has, has him by the hand because I will make of him a great nation. And then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well. She went over, filled the water flask, and gave the boy a drink. God remained with the boy. He lived in the Paran Desert, and his mother found him an Egyptian wife. And now on to Psalm 86, 1 through 10 and 16 through 17. Lord, listen closely to me and answer me, because I am poor and in need. Guard my life, because I am faithful. Save your servants who trust in you, God, my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, because I cry out to you all day long. May your, make your servant's life happy again, because, my Lord, I offer my life to you. Because, my Lord, you are good and forgiving, full of faithful love for all those who cry out to you. Listen closely to my prayer, Lord. Pay close attention to the sound of my request for mercy. Whenever I am in trouble, I cry out to you, because you will answer me. My Lord, there is no one like you among the gods. There is nothing that can compare to your works. All the nations that you've made will come and bow down before you, Lord. They will glorify your name because you are awesome and a wonder worker. You are God, just you. The Gospel reading for this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. Hear now the word of the Lord. Disciples aren't greater than their teacher, and slaves aren't greater than their master. It's enough for disciples to be like their teacher and slaves like their master. If they have called the head of the house Belzebul, I don't know how to say that in English, Belzebul in Spanish. It's certain that they will call the members of his household by even worse names. Therefore, don't be afraid of those people because nothing is hidden that won't be revealed and nothing secret that won't be brought out into the open. What I say to you in the darkness, tell it in the light. And what you hear whisper, announce from the rooftops. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can kill the soul. Instead, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Aren't two sparrows sold for a small coin? 
but not one of them will fall to the ground without your father knowing about it already. Even the, even the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before people, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But everyone who denies me before people, I, will also, will, I, I, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I, haven't come to, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. People's enemies are members of their own households. Those who love father or mother more than me are unworthy of me. Those who love son or daughter more than me are unworthy of me. Those who don't pick up their crosses and follow me are not worthy of me. Those who find their lives will lose them, and those who lose their lives because of me will find them. Holy wisdom, holy Lord. What do we do with this text? Right? Let me tell you, this is all God. I think God had a plan. Well, God always had a plan. Let me tell you why I cut it closed. I was, I was here at 11. My little one was all ready. I was proud of myself. I was like, I mean, I'm a first-time mom, and I was like, oh, my goodness, I did my hair. I got a shower. I put my heels on, and I was ready like at 9.50. I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to get there early, blah, blah, blah. I put her to sleep. At 10, 10, 10, 15, she cried. She starts, yeah! yeah. She doesn't want a bottle. The only thing that she wants is to nurse. And you know, in my brain, I'm like, oh my God, I mean, I'm a responsible adult. I'm like, no, you know, I want you to follow a schedule, my schedule, right? Because I have to be there, you know, blah, blah, on time. And I had to breathe a couple of times, not just once, a couple of times to say, you need to, make an, you need to make a decision with my man. And my decision was very easy, right? But here's what I want to share with you. I can come here and say, like most parents do, right? Oh, it was, my ch- it was my child's fault, the reason why I walked, you know, at 11 o'clock there. But it's not my child's fault. I, as an adult, made a decision. I made a decision to nurse my little one because I believe that my ministry right now, my priority, the one ministry that God has called me to is to provide for that little one so that she knows through my care that God is with her, that God loves her. And I was like, why did this happen to me? And then I remember this text. I mean, you know, I've been working with this for a couple of weeks, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. So, and as I'm reading this text, and I'm coming, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm driving here, I said, you know what? I'm going to do something different with this text. And here's what I want us to do. I want to put on like a teacher hat on this for the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I want us to really go into this text. And you know why? Because this text is so rich. And the reason why I read it so slowly was because every word that this scripture tells us, it kind of rubs us the wrong way, right? It kind of makes us uncomfortable. And guess what? I'm glad it did. And if it didn't, not judgment. I'll just take it to prayer. That's all I'm going to say. So here's what I want to do. I want to do something like if I was in the classroom. So let's see this text. We read it beginning on verse 24. If you were here last uh, if you were here last Sunday, you read the beginning of the chapter, right? So the beginning of the, ch- of the chapter 10 starts with Jesus calling on disciples, right? Jesus saying, I want 12 of you to follow me. 
Now, after Jesus tells them, you know, you're going to do this marvelous thing, right? You're going to heal people. Um, you're going to be it, right? Because, you know, when you follow someone so famous, what do you expect? What are your expectations? You can tell me. I'm doing something different. It's okay, you know. Thank you. Thank you. I thought maybe you guys were already sleeping. Okay. So what was that, Leslie? Yeah, right? But, and what else? What else happens? You know, when we want to follow, when we decide to follow some, someone famous, we believe that we're going to get in it too, right? There's a cut for me, right? Because we live in a world where fame is just a currency to covet, right? You know, um, we live in the world of social media, so, you know, how many likes sometimes defines who we are. Uh, how many friends we have on Facebook define who we are. We don't know most of them, but, you know, but at least we have thousands of friends, right? And we crave the likes. So I can imagine these disciples being like, oh, you know, we are going to, we're going to be following Jesus, and we're going to be doing all these great things, performing miracles. We're going to do what he's doing. And Jesus then says these words. Do I have to read them again? It says, disciples are greater than their teacher. Whew. Yeah, yeah, it's quick, right? It's like, ugh. You know, fame, I didn't sign up for this. And I want to read it this way because Jesus is calling you and I to be a disciple today, to renew our vows of discipleship and apostleship today. He says, you and I are no greater than each other. You and I are not greater than, our, than your master. And slaves aren't greater than their master. Whew, I know that's a difficult subject because of where we are, we're in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, you know, the whole concept of slavery, it, it, touches, it touches closer than anywhere else in the country. Yet, we have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be, if you want to follow me, you are not better than the one that sits next to you. So these levels of superiority that surround our community, that surround our society, put them away. Oh, put them away if you want to follow me. But if you want to continue following whatever God you decide is more worth it than I am, then continue doing what you do. I mean, it's an option, right? Didn't I start saying, I made an option, I have to be an adult. I made an option to care for my baby. You have an option to either follow God and follow, and follow the, 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 re the requisites that are in, the, in his contract or not. And I know that slavery is, is over and thank God for that. But what I'm calling our attention, because I'm not pointing fingers, because if I'm pointing fingers, then I'm not following what God is asking me to in order to be a disciple. This is our community. This is our world. So, yes, the concept is over. But sometimes in our heads, when we encounter people on a daily basis, don't, don't, don't it, doesn't it happen sometimes that we think that we're better than someone else? Happens with children. Oh, we're better than children. We, I know better than you. You shut up. You say what I say. You say what I do, right? I, I'm not making this up. I'm, I'm reading it, you know, I'm reading it from the binder, but, but it's here too. It's the Bible, okay? <laughs> There's, as we grow, we think that somehow the years of life make us better, superior than others. That because we have achieved certain successes based on world definition, that somehow that makes me better than you. No. God embodied God's self in the person of Jesus Christ, and it's Jesus who is saying, you, you are not better than your brother. You are not better than your sister. You are the same in the eyes of God. And he says, not only are you not better than the other one is that when you think that you're better people are going to remind you that you're worthless that's what jesus is saying jesus says look if they have called you if they have called the head of the house belzebul it's certain that they will call the members of his household e by even worse names i was telling the children you know when you have to follow someone and this may go to maybe the the younger people in the in the in the audience right now in in, in church 
You know, sometimes we strive to follow the popular person, the popular guy in school, and blah, blah, blah. And we just love to hear, oh, you know, someone is confiding in me. Don't, well, don't we love that, you know? And for the adults in the room, go back to your, you know, high school year or college years, and you were like, oh, I'm in the in crowd, right? Do you remember that? But guess what Jesus is saying? The same way that they're telling you bad things about the other one, when they turn and they're not with you, they're telling the other person bad things about you. So what makes you think you're so special? I'm not saying this. This is what the Bible says. Therefore, Jesus says, don't be afraid of those people because nothing is hidden that won't be revealed. And then Jesus starts saying, look, stop the gossip. Stop saying things in in hidden places and not saying it out the outside. And this is very important. I was, my husband and I uh, run a school, an international school in Texas. That's where we uh, moved from to come here to Alabama. And one, the number one sin that was consuming that community, guess what it was? Gossip. And I'm not talking about, you know, gossip that is like, oh, you know, there's good gossip. No, 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 no. They love, love to talk about people. They love to bring people down instead of lifting people up. And what God is saying, what Jesus is telling his disciples, look, if you want to follow me, everything that you say here, what? You must be able to and willing to say it in public. Whatever you see, whatever you say in the household, you have to say it outside. Whatever you say, you know, whatever you behave, however you behave, whatever you preach in the household, you have to do it outside. And the reason why I bring this up is because Jesus, in, ver- in chapter, at the end of chapter 9, well, at the, in chapter 10, he says, look, I want you guys, I want the two or 12 of you not to go to the Gentiles, but to go to the lost souls, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you know what that means? Is that, that me- this message is for you and I the in crowd of the church, the in Christians, not the outsiders, not the people that we want to attract. Jesus is saying, clean your act here because the people out there are watching. But we're so like, no, let's go out and make disciples. Well, you know, let's just, you know what I mean, following the contract here. And that's why gossip, that's why Jesus is saying, look, don't be saying things out there, right? Or don't be saying things inside and then, you know, put up a face down uh, out there. And the reason why this is very important, okay, in the life of individual churches, okay, and then in the life of the church is because take a look at yourself. We put on this facade. We go, we have a hard time at home. We fight with our, we argue with our spouse, with our children. You know, we have a bad conversation with our parents. And then we dress up and we come to church. And we put up on smiles. And we're like, oh, how are you? Everything is fine, right? Because we believe that God is calling us to be well put together. And I'm not saying that you come in here all like yelling at each other and being angry. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is because I, you know, I, wanna, I don't want you to be like the kids, you know, like they're like, oh, you know, she said this. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm inviting you is, as you are disciples, as Jesus is calling you and calling myself to be disciples, I, Jesus is calling us to be vulnerable with each other. Jesus is calling us to recognize that sometimes you will have bad days, and sometimes it will be on a Sunday. And you will have to come to church. And sometimes you will have to deal with uh, my not so happy, jolly self. And that is okay. I'm not going to be disrespectful toward you, but I need you to recognize my humanity. And I need you to recognize my humanity. You know, one of the interesting things about the bunch, the 12 bunch that Jesus calls, is that one of them is Simon, and he was a zealot. And then another one is Matthew, a tax collector. These, those two would not get along whatsoever. As a matter of fact, they would, they would be so much in the opposite side of things that they would be constantly fighting with each other. And Jesus says, 
ha, I'm going to call both of you to be my disciples. And you're going to be around me and around each other all the time. Doesn't that sound like us? You have the rich, the poor, right? You have white, black, Puerto Rican, blah, 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 whatever labels you want to call, you want to make up. Yet still God calls us to be disciples. And God is making that intentionally so that we can recognize the humanity in, in, in the other, the other can recognize the humanity in me, and then make sure that we are adults with one another so that we can recognize that it's God who call us to be with each other and not our senses of superiority or anything like that. Let's continue. So this is the part that I really want us to get more deep in because I absolutely love, well, before that, it says, Jesus says in this passage, he says, do not be afraid three times. Three times Jesus says, do not be afraid. Well, first of all, Jesus, what are you talking about, right? Because you're calling me to be a disciple and I thought, oh, we're going to be famous, and people are going to give me food, and blah, 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 right, everywhere I go. But then you tell me that I'm not better than this, so that means that I cannot tell other people what to do. And then you tell me that I'm going to be the same as the slave. I mean, I've, I've seen the way the slaves live. I don't want to be like them. I don't want to live like them. And you're telling me I cannot do the things that I'm used to do. I cannot whisper. I cannot say things that are hidden. I can't, you, have, you, call, you call me to, to, to yell at you from the rooftop. Then you say again, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. But be afraid of those who want to hurt you because they can actually hurt your soul. I mean, I don't understand. And then Jesus says, look, don't be afraid because you, you are more valuable to me than anything else. I don't know about you, but this is very confusing, right? I'm like, Jesus, make up your mind. You want us to follow you or don't follow you? You want us to be afraid or don't be afraid? I don't understand. And then this is the part that I was telling you that I want us to get into because I absolutely love this part. Jesus says, don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. People's enemies are members of their own households. I'm gonna read what I I'm gonna read what I wrote because I don't wanna I don't wanna get too sidetracked. I don't come to bring peace, but a sword. Now I pause for effect. It's not that it's it's not that God says, Oh, you know, I wanna I want you guys to kill each other and be violent with one another. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying in the context of what they're living. See, what most of us don't know is that in the Matthean community, families were experiencing division. Par families were experiencing trouble, okay? Don't that, doesn't that sound familiar, you know, right? We are off with our children, you know, they, they grew up at, uh, adolescents and then you go to college and then they become adults and then they think they know more than us you know all that thing right so they were having their own troubles and quarrels the interesting thing is that the Matthean community in particular the, the community that Matthew was writing and reading to they were expecting a Messiah that acted like a king that lifted up all of their problems all of their quarrels and make them whole Meaning, they were, look, they were expecting a Messiah that said, you know what, from now on, we're all going to be happy. From now on, I'm not going to argue with my son. I'm not going to argue with my daughter. I'm not going to argue with my spouse. And we're just going to be living in this utopia. And what Jesus is saying is, nope. That is not what I brought. That, that is not why God sent me here. God sent me here so that I can so that because of me, you can turn against each other. I came here not to bring you peace, 
but to bring a sword. And the thing is that, you know, if you don't take a, if you don't take a closer look at the text, then you miss this. They are living in the empire, in the Roman Empire, that offered them what they call the Pax Romana. So the Roman, the Roman Empire were telling them, you live in peace. What are you talking about? As long as you pay your taxes, right? You live in peace. You, have barely, you, you barely have food to eat, but this is the peace that we bring you. This is the peace that the God, the Caesar, brings to you. So they were, they were saying, you know what? If, I could on, if we can only have another Caesar, but a Caesar that is of God, another King David, then we have banquets and we will be eating all these wonderful things and be at peace with our family. And Jesus says, no. And you know the reason why Jesus says, no, I don't come from that kind of, I don't come to bring that kind of peace? It's because that kind of peace distracts you from God. It distracts you from my parents. It distracts you from actually doing the work that I just called you to do, that it was to be a disciple. And Jesus says, those who love father or mother more than me are not worthy of me. Who? It's like, seriously, Jesus, do you want me to follow you or not? I mean, like, I'm not understanding this, right? Those who love son or daughter more than me are not worthy of me. Those who don't pick up their crosses and follow me are not worthy of me. And those who find their lives will lose them, and those who lose their lives because of me will find them. Here's the thing, okay? Do you know what currency is, right? And I know, you know, I'm getting in murky waters, but, you know, it's okay. You know what, the, you know, the dollar, right? In the United States, the currency is the dollar, right? And everyone in the world wants to have a good source of that currency, right? So for us in this society, in a capitalistic society, what is our currency? And currency not in terms of, like, money. I just want us to think about more broadly of currency. Our currency is wealth, right? Uh, security, success. That is our currency in a capitalistic society. Yet, in a capitalistic society, in order to achieve and acquire all those things, right, what is the ethical system that, that, that guides a capitalistic society? It says, I will, get what I, I'll, I will get what I want, regardless of what your needs are. So if I had to trample on you, I will do so. I will come up with, I will come up with reasons of why that is okay. Because why? Because, you know, I'm called to be successful. So if I live in a big house and you over there live in a small house, then it's your fault because you didn't make the right decision. I'm not, it's not me. I'm just preaching what the text is saying. And I'm not saying this, okay, so that you can feel bad because preachers, some preachers do this and it drives me crazy. I'm not saying that. What Jesus is saying, look, if you want to be my disciple, if you're going to say yes to the call of be my disciple, your entire thinking has to shift. Your entire being has to be turned upside down to the point that when you say that your priority is your family, it's actually not. Because when you say that you love your wife, that you love your husband, that you love your spouse, that you love your son more than you love me, you are not my disciple. I'm not saying this. The Bible is saying it. And that, as I'm preaching it, as I had to prepare for this sermon, it robbed me the wrong way. Because guess what? My daughter is my priority. Didn't I just say that I make a decision to put her first? So this sermon, I'm not here thinking that I'm more righteous than you are. We're all in the same boat because, guess what? We're all called to be disciples. This message is for the in crowd, not for the outside crowd. So Jesus is saying, look, Jesus says this, those who don't pick up their crosses and follow me are not worthy of me. And I absolutely love getting into this. I mean, I'm getting excited. Because if you don't know this, what Jesus is saying, the picture that Jesus is painting is, is, is one that is, oh, it's just horrible. He says, if you're not willing to pick up your cross, listen, chapter 10, Jesus has not been crucified already. 
But the, Mathi, the, the Gospel of Matthew was written after Jesus' resurrection. And we have this text after we celebrate resurrection, after we celebrate Easter, and then after we celebrate Pentecost. And what Jesus is saying, look, if you're not willing to put your life on the line, see the imagery that they were listening, they were, they, they were, vis they were, they were seeing their brains, okay? When Jesus says, if you're not willing to pick up your cross and follow me, then you're not worthy of me. This is what Jesus is saying. Every single, every time they walk into, the Jerusal into Jerusalem, to the city of Jerusalem, guess what? There were lines of crosses filled with people hang from those crosses that were tortured, that were, capti that were uh, cap captured. They were tortured, and then they were put on a cross. And I have to say this for a second. I am sorry that I have to say this for, again, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and for every single African-American person that is here today because those images are very real for, for this community. But Jesus is saying, if you're not willing to pick up this cross, if you're not willing to put yourself in the line for following me, for what I bring, for the message that I'm bringing to you, then don't say you're going to follow me because at the end of the day, you're going to, make, you're gonna, you're going to harm you're going to do way more harm than good. Isn't that why we're in this mess as a community, as a country, as a society? Isn't that, isn't, isn't that why we can't communicate with our children, we can't communicate with our spouse, right? It's because we haven't put Jesus first. It's because we haven't put God first. And you can tell me, well, Ruth, I may, well, what does that mean, putting God first? If you were here, I think I was here, what, two weeks ago preaching? And I went on, I was, I was talking about Matthew, right? And what did God ask us to do? What is the requirement of God to follow him? To show people that God loved them. That means love all of them. That means love them when they talk to you in a way that is not the best, right? When your child is having a temper tantrum, you have to love them, right? When someone asks you for money and you're like, ah, blah, 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 you know, why, you don't, why can't you just manage your finances better? God is not calling you to judge. God is calling you to provide. When someone hurts you, you're like, this person hurts me, so it's better to hold on to anger than to forgive. You're not following God. God is saying, if you want to show someone that you love me and that you're putting me first, show them that you, for, show them forgiveness. Show them their ways. Act differently. See, this text has many triggers for many of us. For the ones who benefited, right, from society, from society, from society systems, and it has and it has triggers for those of us who have not maybe experienced the benefits of that of that system. But at the end of the day, in the same way that Jesus called Simeon the seller, that Jesus called Simeon the seller. And Matthew, the tax collector, Jesus is calling you and me, Jesus is calling this community of Grace Presbyterian Church to be in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to do more than just come to church every Sunday, gather every Friday, and do all the wonderful things that you do with each other. God is calling us to come, meet on Sunday, recharge, and then go out there and show the world what actually means to carry your cross and put your life in the line. And if that means that you lose your wealth, guess what God says? You're going to gain it three, ten times more in heaven. If that means my children are not going to have X, Y, and Z, but someone is going to find God's love, and maybe that someone can actually come out of their darkness, then that's the price you have to pay. That's the price that I have to pay. That it's not easy? No, it's not easy. And it's okay if, it's okay if, you, if you don't agree with me. It's okay if you say, ah, oh, you know what, I don't, we, don't want, we don't want her here. It's okay. It's okay. 
Because the call of discipleship is not a call to make us feel good. It's not a call that we're like, oh, you know, happy-go-lucky, utopia. It's a call to do better, to be better, to be uncomfortable, to experience pain, to experience discomfort, because guess what? With God, we will transform and become beautiful, beautiful butterflies where we can show God's beauty, not ours, but God's beauty, God's love, God's care with the rest of the world. So, I don't know your names, but if I would if I would know them, I would call all on you. Would you like to follow me? Says Jesus to you today. Do you want to follow me? Do you want to follow me? Do you want to be my disciple? Do you? Do you? That's the contract. If you're ready to sign in, let's sign in. If not, that's okay. God still loves you. God will pray for you. Because the, if you are not, if you say no, it's not forever. It's just, get, it's just for, for a while, just, just yet. So I hope that you say yes. And I hope that all of us together encourage one another so that we can make it and be good disciples as God calls us to be. Amen. So let me invite you to, um, oh, <laughs> I didn't see that. Sorry. Yes.
Amen. Let's respond to God's word, to God's call to be a disciple by the statement of faith. Could you put that? Yeah, please stand if you're able. And we're doing, we're, we'll do it responsibly. We believe in God above us. Creator of all things, sustainer of all life. We believe in Christ beside us. Companion and friend, redeemer of all the broken pieces of our universe. We believe in spirit deep within us. Advocate in God, who lives with us eternally. We believe in God's resurrection created, God's resurrection created world. Where all things are fixed and all creation fits together in vibrant harmonies. We believe in God above, beside, within. God yesterday, today, and forever. The three in one, the one in three. We believe in God. Thank you. You may be seated. As we come to share our joys and concerns. I do have two to mention. Uh, Joby LaFoy, who had a procedure last week, is recovering at home. And we also offer our words of, of support to uh, Leslie Dixon and her family at the very unexpected passing of her mother, Mary Ella Stefan, uh, this week. They are um, hoping and planning for a service for her mother at her home church in Montgomery, but those details are yet to come. Are there other prayer concerns or thanksgivings that you would like to mention this morning? Yes, Becky. Good. So Becky's friend who had a double mastectomy is doing well. There, yes, Gilly. For Lena Cross, whose husband died a few weeks back, and so continuing to pray for her. Any others? Let us pray. Loving God, you tell us it is enough for us to be like you, yet we are overwhelmed and discouraged by the injustice that surrounds us and our seeming inability to do anything about it. How are we supposed to be like you, all-powerful God, when we feel so powerless? God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You tell us not to fear those who can kill the body but not the soul, Yet the violence in the world threatens to deaden our hearts, and that scares us. How are we supposed to resist fear when threats seem to abound on all sides? God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You tell us we are of more value than sparrows, yet we notice so many in our neighborhoods and our world who are treated as less than human and even less than a sparrow. How are we to restore dignity to all those whom the world has devalued? God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You tell us to shout from the rooftops what is whispered in secret. In the face of the world's suffering, violence, and despair, whisper in our hearts that we can learn to grow as your disciples who desire to declare to all the love and goodness of God with our voices and our lives. Amen. Let us continue as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us using words and language that are comfortable for you. Our Mother, Father, God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. As Carol comes to give the invitation to generosity with our ushers, please come forward. This is a time to acknowledge the ways God continues to bless us with good gifts. We then share what we have with joy and thanksgiving, returning to God a portion of what God has given us. Let us bring our gifts to God. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. We give thanks, O Lord, for you have provided everything we need. Receive these offerings as our response to your great faithfulness for the praise of Jesus' name. Amen. of our being and wellspring of life. Praise to God, our liberator, who sets us free and gives us hope. Praise to God, the word, the word, love made flesh to dwell among us. Praise to Jesus the Christ, who feeds the hungry and shows us the way. Praise to God, the Spirit, fiery light and rushing wind. Praise to the Holy Spirit, who inspires Come, let us join our triune God, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, at the table of love. We remember and celebrate how God made his love known to us on the night in which he gave himself for us. And on the night that he was betrayed, He took bread and blessed, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given and broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, poured it, Blessed, we have done. He said, this cup represents the new, the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink this. And every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you announce that I will come back. And you will also give an opportunity to share the narrative of your relationship with God. Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood and this is my body, pour out and given for you and for many. As long as we break this bread and share this cup, we share in the love of Christ. 
Eternal God, we bring this bread and wine before you. Let your spirit fill them with your presence to make your son Jesus dwell among us, that through him, in him, and with him, we may give you all honor and praise now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask the servers to come. As the servers come, friends, this is the table of Christ. Christ set up and is inviting you. Everything is ready. Let's partake in this feast. These are the, the gifts of God for the people of God. And we have gluten-free. We're going to have it right here. So if you, if you need to partake for gluten, with gluten-free, please know that we got you. There's, there's plenty of for you as well. Table is ready. By your time is broken for you.
broken for all of us. The blood of Christ shed for us. Let's eat. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have called us to share in God's story of love and inclusion. And so we offer ourselves to its telling. Breathe your life through, our, through ours that your story may continue in us and through us until the world is renewed. Amen. <laughs> to the charge. When it's hard, when it's joyous, when it's inconvenient, when it's healing, go tell the good news of Jesus Christ and remember that you do not go alone. Don't be afraid to say yes to the call of discipleship. It will be hard, but remember you don't go alone. God is with you and we have each other to go along the journey. We are all children of God. Thanks be to God. Now may the unconditional love of God our parent the amazing love and grace of Jesus Christ, God's Son, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us here in this church, gathered here today, and with the rest of the saints spread throughout the world, now and forever. And God's church says, Amen. Amen.